Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, Liverpool. Uh, my name is Luke Donnellan. I'm the Director of Understanding Humanism at uh, Humanists UK. Uh, I'd just like to begin for a moment for asking you all to uh, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Now, one or two of you might be familiar uh, with the words of the Liverpool-born uh, musician and singer John Lennon, member of the uh, guitar-based 1960s pop combo, checks notes, the Beatles. Uh, but he wasn't Liverpool's first dreamer. Uh, the, um, this history has got a, a long and, and, and rich history of free thinking, uh, and uh, of, of, of people, individuals, organisations promoting a uh, humanist approach to life. Um, and to tell us about that today, uh, we've got Maddie Goodall, uh, our Humanist Heritage Coordinator. Uh, Maddie has been working with us at Humanist UK for several years now, uh, initially employed uh, to support the telling of the, the history of humanism in connection with Humanist UK's 125th uh, anniversary. Um, and, uh, and recently, uh, fantastically, able to secure a National Lottery Heritage Grant to uh, continue the Humanist Heritage Project for another, another couple of years. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Maddie now, who's going to tell us a little bit about the, the history uh, of humanism in Liverpool. So a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, and also thank you for coming into this room instead of going to see Robin Dunbar. Um, in case you didn't realise that he's talking now and you feel like you've made a terrible mistake, um, I can just close my eyes for 30 seconds and you can run out if you want. Um, but I am also told that it's being recorded, so um, hopefully you'll be able to see both. Um, needless to say, as much as John Lennon is obviously... A key part of Liverpool's heritage, humanist heritage indeed. Um, there is a longer history, but I will also preface this whole thing by saying that this is a, a necessarily tiny sample of um, the many, many things that could have been talked about when it comes to Liverpool's humanist heritage. Um, Luke's already mentioned the, both the Humanist Heritage Project and the website that's come out of that and also the um, heritage funding that we've just received, or indeed not just, it's June, isn't it? But um, received last year for the next, um, well, until the end of 2024. Um, so the project can continue and we can keep looking at, particularly um, the, the title or the subtitle of the Heritage Fund project is Doers, Dreamers and Placemakers. Um, and it's all about the communities, uh, both physical um, and not physical, virtual, um, that humanists and free thinkers have created around themselves. Um, but because of that physical aspect, I'm focusing on three buildings in Liverpool, um, which are all within a 10 minute or so walk from here. So if you did want to, um, I know there's not much free time in the programme, but if you did want to take a walk and visit them, um, then it would be possible. Um, so if you feel so inspired um, after this then. Please do. Um, this is our little map. Um, I've got the building we're in now as the little house. Um, at the top is Lord Nelson Street. Um, at the very bottom is Upper Parliament Street and in the middle there um, is uh, the site of the former Church of Humanity. Um, so we're gonna take a little virtual stroll around these. Um, Okay, first, um, how many of you are actually from Liverpool, actually? Okay, so you're the experts in the room. Um, anyone familiar already with 17 Trafalgar Warehouse on Lord Nelson Street? Um, so this is the first one we're going to. That was at the top. Um, this was built um, in 1839 as the Hall of Science um, by the Owenites of Liverpool. Um, this was variously described uh, by opponents and fans of it. Um, one described it as the sink of pollution in Liverpool, um, where all of the dirty socialists hung out 
at that point. Um, as I say, it was built by the Owenites. Um, these were followers of Robert Owen, who was a, um, an early, very early socialist. Um, he wanted the uh, complete reorganisation of society along communitarian lines and had a, a vision for equality which um, drew many women to the movement and that will be relevant in a minute when we talk about the opening of um, the Hall of Science. Um, Halls of Science were built to embody overnight principles of learning, of self-education, of discussion. Um, they often had large lecture halls, um, spaces for music and rational entertainment as they described it. Um, and uh, Liverpool's even had an observatory on the top for encouraging astronomical observation. Um, spearheading the creation of this back in 1839 was this man, John Finch. Um, he was Derby-born, the son of a mechanic, um, described by one historian as having impeccable working class uh, background. So he, he truly was a kind of a, well, a self-made man, really. He started work at 14, um, and rose his way through the ranks until he became um, quite a successful iron worker. Um, he was seized throughout his life by various passions. Um, early on, it was Unitarianism. Then it was um, temperance work, and he's said to have been um, responsible for the creation of about 70 different temperance societies um, around the country during that period of his life. Um, ooh, uh, but he was actually um, expelled from the Temperance Society um, because of his Owenism and the atheism that that suggested about him. Um, so he then threw himself wholeheartedly into um, not just Owenism, but um, cooperatives. He started um, one of the early cooperatives um, in, the eight, in the late 1820s um, in Liverpool. Um, and also in 1832, the incredibly named institution of the intelligent and well-disposed of the industrial classes for the removal of ignorance and poverty by means of education and employment and for promoting union and kindly feelings among all ranks, sex and parties. Um, catchy, but short-lived. Um, he was generally involved in lots of the major campaigns of the 1830s, which included um, fighting for the widening of the vote, um, the abolition of the Corn Laws and the adoption of the People's Charter, um, championed by, of course, the Chartists. Um, Finch himself, um, he, as I say, his, his background was Unitarian, but he was very definitely a free thinker. Um, apparently, his mother had been driven um, to death by a kind of religious mania that she had, um, and that really um, set him on a path of the rejection of any kind of narrow creeds or doctrines. Um, he saw in Owenism... Um, a more rational, um, more accordant with the facts and with human nature philosophy, which was better calculated, he thought, to produce Christian philanthropy than those of any other writer, ancient or modern, that has come under my observation. Um, and he was actually directly involved with some of the experimental, but again, not always very successful, um, Owenite communities that were both here in this country and also um, abroad, including New Harmony, famously, um, in America, in Indiana. Um, he was described by another socialist, Lloyd-Jones, um, as a very excellent man, full of honest purpose and good intention, but rather deficient in insight and tact. He was kindly in spirit and prepared to do all in his power for the comfort and welfare of the people with whom he had to deal. He had, however, a half-joking way of saying unpleasant things, which made him rather unpopular. So it gives you some indication of um, John Finch. Um, so it's worth saying here that Liverpool's Hall of Science um, was the largest and the most expensive um, of the halls of science that were built. Um, and it's incredibly exciting that it does still exist. Um, as I say, uh, on Lord Nelson Street, so you can go and have a look. It's apartments now. Um, this was first mooted as an idea in 1839, and the foundation stone um, was laid by Finch um, on the 17th of June, 1839. Um, this was reported as going to have um, 
well, it was for the accommodation of the working classes, very explicitly, um, but for, for rational and moral and upstanding purposes, um, including having this big lecture hall, having this observatory, having places to eat um, and eat cheaply and affordably, um, and generally to, to socialise with one another, and of course to propagate the, the values of Owenism. Um, but it was not without um, quite extreme antagonism um, from various quarters of Liverpool. Um, so, as it was undergoing construction, um, there was a particular preacher, Fielding Auld, um, who began to organise a campaign specifically against um, the Owenites and their, their building. Um, there was even... Ooh, I think I just touched an extra one and uh, propelled myself. Um, there was even a, a large meeting um, called at which Finch himself turned up and was assaulted. Um, so it was really quite um, extreme, the antagonism towards um, Owenism, and I'll read you a little um, extract of some of the descriptions. But nevertheless, um, they were successful. Um, they even raised a large petition of hundreds of signatures um, to carry on with the building. So there was support, um, and of course there were... Um, many hundred shareholders as well um, who helped to build it. It cost £5,000, um, which today, apparently, according to the Bank of England inflation calculator, is about 420000 which was actually less than I thought, um, but still, an expensive undertaking and a, a large one. Um, and they decided to open the hall on when else but Good Friday. Um, and this was particularly scandalous to the good Christians of Liverpool. Um, the Liverpool Standard, in particular, took serious issue with this. Um, and I can't help but quote from this, um, because it's so vitriolic. Um, we alluded briefly in our last publication to a placard which has been circulated during the present week announcing the intended desecration of Good Friday by the disgusting and depraved disciples of the infidel Robert Owen. On this day, which is set apart by the church as one of solemn and deep humiliation, the filthy and obscene professors of socialism have dared to fix for the opening of their temple of profanity and licentiousness. It was not sufficient that their increasing influence in numbers should be persuaded before the, paraded before the public. It was not sufficient that socialism should be able to emerge from the kennel and the sty. But an opportunity must at the same time be taken to outrage the feelings and to mock the time-hallowed associations of a great Christian community by the wanton and deliberate desecration of one of its most solemn festivals." And they go on to bemoan the fact that this is happening in the great commercial town of Liverpool. This foul breath of infidelity has been allowed to ascend like the smoke of the burning cities of the plain and to darken and obscure from the eyes of mankind the cheering presence of the throne of mercy. Um, in fact, actually, not all of the um, Owenites by any stretch were completely um, anti-religion or, or indeed atheist. Um, Owen himself had in fact been very religious as a young boy, was nicknamed the Little Parson because he was so pious. Um, but he then read, um, he tells us, um, about all of the different religions and decided that none of them um, made sense or, or were good forms by which to live. Um, and so the rational religion, the kind of earthbound religion of the Owenites, um, was what was landed on. Um, but this idea of religion um, and the word religion being taken and um, given to something else, I suppose, that is stripped of a kind of supernaturalism um, comes through all three of these places um, that we look at. I've got up here Robert Owen himself and also Margaret Chapelsmith. Um, and I'll say for this picture of Margaret Chapelsmith that this is the only one that exists and it was given to us or shared with us by somebody who came into possession of it completely by accident um, he's a researcher of family history and somebody had gave it to him to research. Um, and then when we shared it on Facebook, somebody colorized it and made it look um, like a real human person. So it's incredibly exciting to see Margaret Chapelsmith um, like this. Um, so on the, the day of the opening, this was 20th of April, 1840, uh, Good Friday. Um, and it was reported a lot more favorably in the Liverpool Albion. Um, on Friday, the followers of Mr. Owen opened their new Hall of Science in Lord Nelson Street. 
The building is spacious and is well adapted for lectures and public assemblies. Mr. Finch opened the business by giving out a social hymn, after which he read as a lesson a portion of one of Mr. Owen's works in praise of virtue and also a hymn of the same subject. Mr. Robert Owen addressed the assembly. He said that the opening of that room was a certain sign that a great change was coming over the world. Mr. Owen denied the rumours that have been spreading respecting his system and said, so far from the socialists wishing to introduce blasphemy, infidelity, prostitution and promiscuous intercourse, the world was already so full of these vices that a change was loudly called for. And such a change it was their object to introduce. After some explanations of his principles, Mr. Owen said he sought investigation. Um, and then he talks about the state of the manufacturing districts. He mentions Manchester um, and how... Uh, people are still living in, in desperate poverty um, and that people don't seem to know what to do about it, but of course Owenites know what to do about it. Um, after further remarks, he said he hoped in the evening to lay down a system for the amelioration of mankind, and that was his plan. After the lecture was concluded, Mr. Owen was called upon to name two children, and in doing so, the speaker dwelt at some length upon the minds of the children being completely at the mercy of society. Um, and this is something key to Owen's ideas as well, this idea that um, people were shaped by their environment um, and weren't born to be in one state or another, weren't born naturally to be um, in poverty and only uh, capable of uh, living in poverty um, or living lives of, um, you know, vice or anything such as that. Um, and Owenite naming ceremonies are a really, really interesting kind of precursor to our humanist naming ceremonies now, um, where we talk about... Uh, what values um, the parents hold, of course, and also what values we'd like the, the children to be brought up around and how the community can support it. Um, and that's exactly what the Owenite um, ceremonies did. After that, there was a lecture by Mrs. Chapelsmith in support of the rights of women. The fair lecturer insisted upon the right of women to the same mental culture as men um, and to an equal share in the government of the nation. At the conclusion of the lecture, a tea party was held, uh, which Mrs. Chapelsmith provided. Um, so we're kind of moving on from the traditional roles, but um, nevertheless, time for tea still um, overseen by Margaret. They also opened a juvenile school of science um, the following year in February 1841. Um, and that did go up to an attendance of over 100 boys and girls. Um, and they charged fees on a graduated scale, and it was again influenced by this idea and Owen's own belief in the importance of education um, for determining the life of an individual. Um, tragically, it was quite short-lived as an Owenite hall. Um, by May 1842, it had been ceased to be used by them, um, and it was subsequently sold to the Odd Fellows um, for 4,600, so less than they'd paid to build it. Um, it later became um, a music hall um, known as the Nelson Assembly Rooms, um, and apparently it was a music hall that could hold up to 2,700 people in the main hall. Um, so it had a, an interesting life um, and a significant beginning as well with these two real heavyweights um, of the movement. Margaret Chapel Smith, like lots of the women actually, um, who became very prominent in the Owenite movement, had been in her youth and younger years um, very, very strongly religious. Um, and when she turned away from that, she did it wholeheartedly um, and used her, uh, her knowledge of um, religious teachings um, and of the Bible to um, preach against it, really, um, on behalf of the Owenite um, school of thought. Next, I'm going to move down to this middle, uh, no, to the very bottom star, sorry. I'm doing this a bit out of order. It would be a strange walk to do, um, but you could change the order if you did decide that you would like to do this. Um, to the um, star at the very bottom on Upper Parliament Street, um, which, again, still exists. Um, and this Google shot even includes a Just Eat um, cyclist just to really hammer home that we are in the present day. Um, this is now um, the Church of St. Peter and Paul um, at 35 Upper Parliament Street, um, but it was built um, in 1913 as the Church of Humanity or the Temple of Humanity um, by the Liverpool positivists um, who had been around and been meeting together since um, 1879. So there was already a kind of 40-year tradition at the time of th that this was built um, of positivism. 
Um, positivism drew on the ideals of um, Auguste Comte um, and his idea of um, society progressing um, through various stages of, of kind of enlightenment. Um, he himself advocated essentially a, a religion, a secular religion of humanity um, where we praised um, and celebrated the achievements of human beings rather than any supernatural entity. Um, and the positivist and the early ethical movement, which would become the humanist movement that we know today, um, had not just a fair amount in common um, at various times, um, but also lots of um, figures in common. So Harriet Martineau, a very prominent um, free thinker um, and friend of the Darwins, um, she translated Comte's positivist philosophies in 1853 and really helped to uh, get them uh, more popular um, and spread them um, among English people. Others who were influenced included John Stuart Mill and George Eliot, um, both, again, very prominent and, and significant um, free thinkers and, and humanists. Um, it was exciting for the... Uh, positivists that were in London and had chapels of their own to know that this was happening in Liverpool and they wrote admiringly of how the movement here had proceeded with a quiet determination developing itself freely in such form as been thought suitable and introducing itself introducing accompaniments such as the steady um, devotion of its members could supply that meant vocal as well as instrumental music and the reproduction of the busts um, and other decorations of the space, um, which were seen to give um, physical form to the values that they held. And this will come up again when we visit our last stop um, in the, the ethical movement as well. Um, I've got here um, a motto of um, the positivists, which was very influential again on some of the key figures in the history of the, the humanist movement, um, notably Frederick James Gould, who was a pioneer of moral... Um, so secular um, kind of civic education, um, who was incredibly influenced by this um, and very influenced by positivist ideas in general. Um, positivism did come under, again, criticism from people, not least because of how heavily ritualised it, it could be. Um, they had their own calendar, they had feast days, they had uh, various um, kind of uh, quite as I say, ritualised ways of doing things. Um, and as you've also heard, a very kind of quasi-religious service. Um, and that led to critics such as T.H. Huxley, famously, um, decrying it as uh, Catholicism minus Christianity, um, which perhaps wasn't unfair. Um, in fact, the, uh, the statue of Mary and Child, um, well... The whole space <laughs> looks very similar uh, today as a Catholic church as it did um, back when the positivists first created it. Um, but it is important, and positivism was a, a really significant um, kind of early expression, um, well, in, in the latter part of the 19th century, early 20th century, um, which did capture the, the minds of lots of people, including people within um, the humanist movement and some very influential ones too. Um, unfortunately, again, um, the, uh, the Temple of Humanity, the Church of Humanity in Liverpool, um, didn't last very long. Um, this was partly because of criticisms people had with the um, ideals of positivism, um, but it was also rocked by a, a double murder that happened um, where a young man um, who was associated with the church um, who had taken a liking to another um, female member of the church, um, essentially um, turned up, not at the church, at the house, um, shot her, shot another person that was in the house, and then killed himself. Um, and this was a, a kind of scandal associated with the, um, the Temple of Humanity that they, they couldn't really get past. Um, so it did fail fairly quickly, um, and again was, um, became, in fact... Uh, a Christian scientist church um, within a couple of years of it first um, being built. Um, 
going to uh, round off or end by moving towards something that is maybe more familiar to us um, in terms of the history, um, as I say, of, of our own movement um, with the Ethical Society. Um, and what I've got here is um, Mayor Beer Hall, um, or, uh, on Mayor Beer um, Street, yes, um, which is now uh, the Hard Walk Cafe. Anyone familiar? <laughs> <laughs> um, this was an early meeting place of the Liverpool Ethical Society, um, who were formed in 1904. Here are some examples of um, some of the talks that happened both at Maybeer Hall on Hardman Street um, and also at uh, some of its other locations. So they also met on Colquitt Street, um, again, not too far away. Um, until later they did um, have an ethical church of their own. Um, you can see at the top left here, Charles Watts. Um, he did the inaugural lecture of the Ethical Society in 1904 on the mission of rationalism. Um, other notable speakers who visited Liverpool um, included Teresa Billington Grieg, another um, really fascinating and important both freethinker and suffragist, um, who was one of the founders of the Women's Freedom League. Um, and she came here and spoke um, for the, uh, the cause of women's franchise, again, at um, the Liverpool Ethical Society. There was also um, Hira uh, Hypatia Bradlaugh Bonner, um, daughter of the better-known Charles Bradlaugh, who founded, of course, the National Secular Society. But she herself was a very prominent secularist and humanist thinker and activist, um, and it's interesting here that she's talking about militarism in India um, and then free thought in the old century and the new. Um, and she was also the founder of what was called the Rationalist Peace Society um, in 1910, a really interesting woman, again, with lots of causes, both explicitly secularist and also generally humanitarian, which is the thread that really runs through. Um, at the bottom here as well, we've got Harry Yulden, who we'll come on to a little bit more. Um, and also Eleanor Rathbone, who spoke also at a meeting of the Men's League for Women's Suffrage, which was founded again um, by, uh, or co-founded by some uh, quite prominent humanists um, at the time. And this, again, uh, is really just designed to give you a bit of an insight into some of the myriad causes that in the early 20th century, um, and indeed the latter 19th century, um, humanists and members of the ethical societies were taking up. Um, couldn't resist using this picture of Stanton Coit. Um, he just really, I don't know, he looks like he's got something to tell us. Um, this is, uh, well, Stanton Coit, as I say. He's often seen as kind of a, a bit of a, a godfather, really, of the, for want of a better word, um, of the, the early humanist movement. Um, he helped to facilitate what was the Union of Ethical Societies in 1896, which brought together these societies um, and would eventually become Humanists UK over a, a few name changes between 1896 and, and today. And their aims were, as elucidated here, by purely natural and human means to assist individual and social efforts after right living, to free the current ideal of what is right from all that's merely traditional or self-contradictory, and thus to widen and perfect it, and to assist in constructing a theory or science of right, which, starting with the reality and validity of moral distinctions, should explain their mental and social origin and connect them in a logical system of thought. It was really about coming up with an ethical system which did not rely on a supernatural power and did not require people who were members of the societies to agree on that, to agree on the existence of an afterlife or a supernatural being or anything. Um, and I mention this because um, Harry Yulden, who I mentioned before, um, was clearly quite influenced by um, Stanton Coit. So although Harry Yulden, um, by the time of the 1910s, was based in Liverpool, um, he was originally a Baptist minister, um, and the Baptist minister at Pembroke Chapel, um, which doesn't stand anymore but used to be um, on Pembroke Street. Um, he was drawn to the ethical movement um, in around 1912. Um, and it seems like this might have been linked to or um, 
perhaps the, the cause in some ways of a kind of breakdown of health and possibly a breakdown of mental health, um, which led to him renouncing the ministry at um, the Pembroke Chapel um, and indeed the Baptist faith and instead moving into the ethical movement where he founded the Liverpool Ethical Church in 1912. Um, ethical churches are a really strange thing and there were only a handful of them um, across the country. Um, a couple in London, most famously this one pictured in Bayswater, which was the baby of Stanton Coit. Um, they decorated it, again, as you can see, kind of from this picture, with various busts and illustrations that, were, um, that exemplified the values they admired. Um, so that took influence for everything from the classical world to actually key religious figures like uh, Buddha or Jesus, um, and also to other secular figures like Josephine Butler, um, who campaigned against the Contagious Diseases Act, and various others. You can see some of the, the busts and the drawings. It was decorated by Walter Crane, um, the famous um, artist, and the painting that you can see behind there, which shows various um, figures passing on a torch to one another, um, the race of hero spirits. Um, he was responsible for that. And also decorating the ceiling, um, blue, with uh, kind of stars on it. And again, it's a Catholic church today. Um, it's in London, in, um, in Bayswater, as I say. Um, and you can see uh, from this picture that it, it retains, uh, well, characteristically, um, that image. Stanton Coit is interesting because although he appeared to maintain this kind of attachment to or interest in the trappings of religion, he very consciously wanted to redefine the, the notion of religion, uh, the notion of God, um, to mean more like things that were admirable um, or values that should be emulated um, or, or worked towards um, and he wrote in 1927 um, that he, half a century earlier, had unreservedly accepted the supremacy of reason. Um, and he thought this was a, a constructive development in the, the ways of things. Um, he wanted to detach religious sentiment from every form of belief in superhuman intelligences and supernatural forces, and instead attach it, as we saw with the aims of the ethical societies, to purely natural powers um, and what human beings could, could do. Um, and he wanted that to be this practical actualization of truth, beauty, and justice on earth, which had, in fact, quite a lot in common with the aim of the Owenites, who, who wanted a kind of, um, wanted to bring about a paradise on earth instead of waiting for it um, after death. What's interesting is that in 1912, um, Harry Yulden spoke at the Ethical Church while he was still... Um, a mem or the, the minister, or the reverend of Pembroke Chapel. And his lecture was entitled The Impertinence of Trying to Save Other People's Souls, um, which is excellent, and I would have loved to be there. Um, he, as I say... Um, oh, actually, no, I won't go on to that. This looks like a lot to read. Um, he started the Ethical Church in Liverpool... Um, he, uh, originally they were called the Ethical Church but they were meeting in other halls eventually they moved into an actual chapel um, uh, on Windsor Street um, which again doesn't seem to exist anymore um, and uh, held services they had social hymns as they called them um, and he lectured um, every Sunday until his unfortunately early death um, in 1916 and so an example would be um, a service in 1913 included an 11 a.m. lecture on the pleasure of finding out how much we can bear um, and a 7 p.m. lecture on the infinite possibility of human culture. Um, and he lectured, uh, as far as I can see, every, every Sunday. And he described this in adverts, including adverts in the Literary Guide, which is now the New Humanist, um, as a, a humanitarian religion. Um, and Yulden himself was very interested in um, humanitarian causes, in suffrage, in um, the labour movement in particular, and very outspoken um, about that. He contributed a number of hymns um, to Coit's social worship, 
um, which was a book of, again, secular hymns, sometimes written especially, sometimes poems um, uh, set to music. Um, it was uh, kind of experimental. It was something that the ethical societies did. This was a massive two-volume work, um, and you can get a sense from um, this particular um, title called Belief in Life um, about the things that Harry Yulden um, was expressing a belief in rather than in a God. Um, so in liberty, strength and delight, um, in uh, the, the non-finality of any creed, religion, form of government, social order, any of that. Um, it was quite kind of radical and certainly idealistic in many ways. Um, and here it is on the right set to music. Um, and he contributed loads. I've only got this up here, not so you can uh, feel you have to read everything, but just to show quite how many of Harry Yulden's um, songs um, that actually probably came from his own book, um, which he published called The Manual of Ethical Worship, um, which were, again, this kind of hi these hymns um, in praise, but praise of nature, praise of fellowship, um, praise of human beings and, um, and all of the values that, that he was after. Um, but I'm going to, to close because this has all uh, seemed very much as though um, it was all deeply religious um, or kind of religion disguised as something else. Um, but in fact, uh, this, according to Harold Blackham, who became um, famously, of course, known as the architect of the modern humanist movement, um, this was very much uh, part of the, the kind of necessary, perhaps, history of the development of the um, organized humanist movement. Um, and he wrote interestingly about um, Coit in his kind of, uh, well, uh, later on. Um, Blackham originally entered the ethical movement, the humanist movement, um, as an assistant to Coit at the Ethical Church in Bayswater in the 1930s. Um, when Coit died in 1944, Blackham took over, um, and he went on to become the chair of the um, Ethical Union, as it was then, and ultimately the first executive director of the British Humanist Association um, in the 1960s. Um, but when he describes this, he talks about arriving um, and knowing that he was going to essentially try and strip away all of um, Coit's strange religious trappings. Um, he tells the Humanist magazine, the New Humanist, in 1977, I'd come to London to succeed Stanton Coit at the Ethical Church. To many in the ethical movement and to most in the RPA and the NSS, what he was doing at the Ethical Church was bizarre tomfoolery. Having prepared myself by reading his books, I had a better understanding of what he was at. Before the First World War, church-going was socially established among the respectable. The ethical societies offered their alternative. Coit's ethical church, in its heyday at that time, was an alternative closer to the model of the Church of England. An alternative cast as a takeover bid, a daring tactic, a Trojan horse. Um, he gave nothing away of his rationalism, secularism, socialism. He incorporated and ritualized them. It was done with panache, these are still Blackham's words, using the decorative talents of Walter Crane and the musical talents of Kennedy Scott, which is Charles Kennedy Scott, founder of the London Philharmonic uh, Choir, um, and the artistic skills of many others. He was eclectic to excess, he says, and put on a show that had no rival of its kind in London. Um, and he talks about how this played into a kind of modernist movement within the church, um, that there was a rationale, there were precedents. Um, and he writes, it looked as though things might go that way. Um, but when Blackham came on the scene, he says the tide had ebbed. Um, we were in the doldrums between the wars. I made it clear that I was more interested in the ethical movement than in the ethical church. And in due course, I returned the church to the West London Ethical Society, which is what it had been before, and sold the building to the Roman Catholic Church. This was done, like most such changes, with some consent and some resistance, and not all at once. Coit himself was an extraordinary figure, charismatic and totally autocratic, he says, yet the loudest spokesman for democracy and individual autonomy. Um, it's, 
interesting to note here that Coit had this idea that the ethical movement would kind of take over the Church of England and that it would be a kind of secularised system. Um, and actually, that's something that our friend from earlier, John Finch, also wanted. He wanted the C of E um, to essentially be become a secular educational body. So again, there's these kind of strange echoes between the two. After the war, black and rights, I took over as secretary of the ethical union with the determination to enlarge the moral basis of the movement by recovering the whole humanist tradition. Um, he writes, which derived from the Greek sophists, the French philosoph philosophes, and the British Unitarians or philosophical radicals. We know now of course, um, and I'm sure Blackham had an idea too, that in fact humanist traditions can be found everywhere um, throughout time across um, continents, but that um, kind of tradition um, was very important to that redefining and that self-expression as humanist, as explicitly humanist as we'd understand it today um, of the movement in the 1960s. Um, and again, I don't show you this so that you can read it all, but just as an illustration of what from this point in the 60s and 70s, the humanist movement kind of exploded into, really. They had this conscious um, expression of what it meant to be humanist. Um, it was about um, expressing your agnosticism, your unbelief. It was about what you believed in also. Um, and it was about this philosophy that could tell people um, or explain to people a kind of system of, of thinking. Um, and this is an article that appeared in the Liverpool Echo. Um, and again, in a strange echo, um, as part of a series that was um, published over the course of Easter with different people in different faith and belief representatives talking about what their um, beliefs about, um, or what, what religion means to me, in fact. And this was the chair chairman um, or chairperson of the Merseyside Humanist Group, um, Gillian Minns, talking about um, what it meant to her. Um, and she even talks about a really lovely example of her own grandfather, um, and I'll end on this because it's a nice little um, joke, uh, who at 103 years old told her, it's a good thing I'm not a Christian, he said shortly before his 103rd birthday, or I'd think that God had either forgotten me or didn't want me. Oh. Um, and I will end on that because I've been talking for quite a while. Like I say, a tiny selection really of all of the um, varied, much longer, vast history of humanism in Liverpool, which of course also includes explicit rationalism and secularism that was happening at the same time as some of these um, other places um, and groups. But I wanted to emphasize these three, um, partly because if you are so inclined, you can go and visit them. Um, thank you, and I'm going to end, uh, I'm going to leave up this picture of Coit, because <laughs> why not? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Maddie. Fascinating talk. Well, can, really interesting to hear how... Um, uh, kind of the very Liverpool-specific stuff kind of ties in with the, uh, the movement more nationally as well. Uh, we haven't got a great deal of time, but we have got a little bit of time for a few questions, uh, if, anybody, if anybody has them. Uh, so do pop up your hands and uh, we will send uh, the roving mic over to you. Uh, while you're perhaps just thinking of any questions you might have, is with the, um, uh, the Liverpool Ethical Society, then, did, did that become, was that, was that one of the societies integrated into the Union of Ethical Societies then, so... Yeah, so it became, uh, as I said, it was founded in 1904, it became part of the Union in 1911, um, and then it dissolved in 1922, um, which was the case for quite a number of the societies that the, the 20s um, and that kind of interwar period was a, a challenging time, um, and lots of those, those groups kind of fell away. Um, but a really interesting example which is kind of specific to Liverpool at the same time as being, you know, representative and having lots in common with the ethical societies elsewhere, particularly that tie-in with um, suffrage, with um, activism, um, uh, political activism, um, with lots of the kind of concerns that they had, um, including secularism as well, um, but all these other things. Because the union starts with the four, the four London-based ethical societies, um, but then it, it obviously kind of absorbs 
more of them. How, how many are there and kind of what, what sort of spread geographically around the UK do they, do they come from? So they were really spread around the UK. There was upwards of 70 societies um, at one point. Um, I think at any given time there was about 46 um, associated with, with the union. I think it peaked in around 1906. Um, and they were, they were really different in character. So if anybody was in Belfast last year, they might have heard me talk about the Belfast Ethical Society, um, which is a really interesting um, example, again, both of the, the spread of the, the movement, but also the link directly with the labour movement in particular, because the, um, the, the labour group and the um, ethical society were at various points kind of one and the same, really. Um, and what I think is really interesting with that, the spread and the number of ethical societies, is that they were very different um, depending on the kind of regional characters. Um, and of course, the figures who led and, and made them up, but also um, just depending on the, the particular concerns of, of where they were, were coming from. Um, so, yeah, a, a big spread and an interesting set. Thank you. I can see a couple of hands up. If you have got questions, do put your hands right up because it's a little bit difficult to see you. But we've got one question over here, uh, one in the middle there, and then one at the front. So we'll go in that order. So, yeah, at the back first. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Um, mine is a very personal question because, um, and it comes from really the, the previous talk about the politics and how the Liberal Party was quite allied to the humanist ideas. In your research, did you find out anything about, and I'm not quite sure that the dates align completely, but the then editor of the Liverpool Post, who was editor for nearly 50 years, Edward Russell, whether he had any connection with the humanists? I don't know is the answer to that. Um, it's something I'm coming back to do another time. Yeah, I'd about. love to find yeah. out. I think it's... Uh, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if now, if I go back and have a look, the name do, you know, does appear. Um, it's, there is a very strong connection um, between those kind of, um, the, the political um, sympathies and the, um, the ethical movement as it was, both in terms of the figures who were directly associated with it and the kind of policies that were being adopted. Um, but I don't, it's not a name I'm familiar with, so I would be really interested to, to know the answer to that. Thanks. Uh, we've got Ruth in the, in the middle there, Liam, thanks. Where's the third one? Thanks very much. I think my question might follow on from one of you, the comment that you made just before the last question uh, about um, local uh, reflecting regional issues. Liverpool has quite a reputation for being a special city and with a special history. So I wondered whether it was visible in the looking at the history of, of the development of the Ethical Society here, for example, whether there were things which were specifically Liverpool. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the... Certainly, the, within the um, so we talked obviously at, at the start more about the kind of Owenite uh, links and the relevance there. Um, that was certainly linked to the um, the kind of industrialisation, um, the members. Um, so one of the people that first suggested the Hall of Science, for example, was a, a cord wainer, and I know that that was one of the industries that was. Um, uh, growing um, or, or a key part of, um, of the city at that time. Um, in terms of the, the ethical societies themselves, it's an interesting one because Harry Yulden's the, the person that kind of, uh, his name comes up most, but he wasn't actually from <laughs> Liverpool. Um, so it's a bit of a, um, uh, a bit misleading maybe. Um, I suppose, yeah, I don't know if I can really give a good answer to that, actually. It's, 
so, like I say, it's, I think it's easier when it is very much the, not easier, but you can certainly identify it, like I say, in the kind of the concerns of the, the ONIs, which in some ways were taken up then by um, uh, the Chartists and, and other kind of radicals. Um, the ethical movement, it has to be said, was a bit more of a kind of uh, middle class movement of, oftentimes. Um, and I, I don't know if that kind of bore out in Liverpool um, in the same way because I haven't seen the, um, the kind of membership lists or anything. You can get an idea sometimes. Um, but uh, it was interesting, definitely, that there was this... Um, and again, maybe it's just what I kind of ended up seizing on, but it, it was interesting that they had these very strong... Um, even where small groups of people who were really pushing forward, like the positivists, like the, the idea of the ethical church. I mean, Liverpool having an ethical church being pretty much the only one outside of London is fascinating. There's a kind of, uh, why did that kind of particularly uh, come about here? Why was that the direction? Was it just because Harry Yulden happened to defect from the, the Baptists or, um, or was there a, you know, something else about the particular kind of, um, I don't know, tempo? I think he actually took quite a number of people from his congregation at um, Pembroke Chapel with him to his, to his ethical church. So that kind of movement towards a... Um, yeah, I guess a very active, practical faith by that name or whatever. Sorry, that's a really long answer. And not particularly directly linked, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's always a really interesting question. Thank you. So we've got some time for one, one more question, I'm afraid, because we've got, we've got the break after this. So, Ian. Yeah, well, my question is actually quite related to that one. Yeah, last year, as you say, in Belfast and, you know, the work we've been doing since then, uh, the our equivalent of uh, Coat and and Yolden, I suppose, was Knox, and he was, you know, famously a one-eyed propagandist for atheism and socialism. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, in Belfast, there was, um, I suppose, a recognition through um, the nineteenth uh, century that it was dangerous, actually, to get involved with religion. In fact, you you wanted to eschew that uh, because of the you know, the, the unionist nationalist kind of uh, divide. It's surprising that that wasn't the case in Liverpool, which was a sectarian city as well. Uh, so I, I think there's... We have a, lots of Irish, actually. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. an awful lot uh, to go into there, really, to, to wonder why it was that in Belfast the ethical society was, uh, as you say, very working-class based, but non-sectarian, non-religious, mm wanted to escape from that, whereas here it seemed maybe there's more of a London influence rather than that influence of Ireland. Sorry, uh, 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 sort of half a question. No, but again, that, is a, that would be incredibly interesting to look into. And again, if they're... I haven't seen that they do, but if they did exist uh, kind of membership records and ways to look kind of more deeply into who was part of the ethical society in Liverpool um, or the ethical church, you might get a sense. I know there was a, you know, a strong tradition in Liverpool of um, nonconformism and, and nonconformist churches. Um, so whether, again, that had some influence on the... I guess, the, te the tendencies um, of kind of um, uh, religious practice or, or even when there was. But like I say, there were also, you know, there was, there was a secular society, there was a rationalist um, society, there were, there were other groups, so there were, there were different choices you could make, I suppose, based on, based on that. But it would be, because as you say, both the kind of uh, proximity and, and also there were large numbers of, um, of Irish living here as well. So how that played into it would be a really interesting kind of sociological question of it. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you.